man and family in building such a world. Thank you so much. seems to be the gateway to happiness in heaven, but as a psychologist says, it's also the birthplace of most of our neurosis. So we are challenged to make happy families, and so maybe uh, policies from where we go now should be how we can really make happy marriages and families. Thank you very much, and have a nice break. We'll come back at uh, 4.45. Thank you. It's nice to have a talk, talk and chat, coffee. So we will start our next uh, panel. Uh, this is about uh, the unique contribution of civil society, NGOs and faith-based organizations in transferring marriage and family in the 21st century. So I present myself first. I, my name is Brigitte Wada. I am a, a president of the Women's Federation in France and also vice president of the Women's Federation in Europe. So I'm very happy to be able to uh, lead this uh, panel with uh, very, uh, very nice people, I think. It will be very interesting panel. <laughs> so um, I may start to speak in French just to present the first speaker. Uh, then he, he will feel himself at home. <laughs> That's what he said to me. So, um, the first, le premier, uh, le premier présent, le premier uh, qui va parler, Monsieur uh, Afid Wardiri. Il est uh, Monsieur Afid Wardiri est un des fondateurs de la grande mosquée de Genève. Il est aussi le porte-parole pendant 30 ans. Et puis aussi, il est le président fondation de l'entreconnaissance à Genève. Donc, euh, Monsieur Wardiri euh, fait aussi le, le Ramadan. Donc, je voulais aussi le mentionner. Il, euh, il jeûne. Hein. Donc, euh, voilà, il va nous introduire euh, son, son thème. C'est pour vous. Merci, euh, Madame la Présidente. Euh, merci. Euh... Salam alaikum, que la paix de Dieu soit avec vous. Je, je cherchais l'introduction, puis je ne trouve pas mieux comme introduction. Et merci donc aux organisateurs de m'avoir demandé de venir euh, parler de la famille. Je pense que nous sommes tous capables de parler de la famille, étant donné que nous, avons tous, nous sommes tous issus d'une famille, et nous avons aussi euh, mis en place une famille. Donc euh, je pense que chacun d'entre nous est, est capable d'en parler. Euh, je ne crois pas qu'il faille être un génie ni un expert pour dire qu'aujourd'hui la famille va mal et l'économie aussi. Ce qui fait que nous sommes face à un grand, deux grands défis. C'est comment faire en sorte pour que la famille puisse retrouver son sens, comment faire que l'économie euh, cesse de dicter les lois et cesse de faire de nous que de la chair à économie. J'ai écouté certaines des interventions et je me rends compte en définitive que nous sommes capables aujourd'hui simplement de comprendre comment les choses se sont faites pour que l'on se trouve dans cette situation. On peut faire des expertises extraordinaires pour dire comment on en est là, mais ce qui serait intéressant, c'est de faire en sorte que, après le constat de la situation que nous vivons, nous puissions éventuellement reprendre les valeurs éducatives qui nous ont euh, appris comment être capable de créer une famille et de vivre en cette famille de manière heureuse et de tirer le maximum de ce que cette famille peut nous apporter de positif et ne pas simplement 
la condamner pour ce, que, ce qui ne va pas. Alors, en tant que musulman, je dois vous dire que la question de la famille n'est pas laissée au tâtonnement de l'être humain. Euh, il y a, bien entendu, des textes clairs, tant dans le Coran que dans la tradition prophétique, pour nous apprendre qu'est-ce que c'est que la famille et quelle importance elle a. Et bien sûr, la famille euh, commence par le rapport que peut avoir un homme et une femme dans l'affection qu'ils doivent nourrir les uns aux autres, euh, dans l'amour qu'ils doivent se porter, dans la patience qu'ils doivent avoir à vivre ensemble et dans la manière de savoir conjuguer « nous » alors qu'avant ils conjuguaient « je ». Comment conjuguer avec la, per les, la personne au pluriel « nous » et arrêter de dire « je » et l'autre aussi dit « je ». Ils doivent tous les deux utiliser le « je », mais ensemble ils doivent savoir conjuguer « nous ». Donc la famille est absolument, selon la tradition de l'islam, la famille est absolument essentielle parce qu'elle est euh, celle qui va, d'une part, permettre à l'humanité de se régénérer et d'autre part, euh, dans la tradition de l'islam, la famille est le lieu où, où l'on trouve tout ce qui est nécessaire pour pouvoir euh, répondre aux situations euh, difficiles qui pourraient apparaître à cause de circonstances particulières. Je dois là saluer, parce que je, je risquerai de l'oublier, cette charmante dame suisse qui a parlé des trois punitions que nous subissons ici en Suisse. Et je soutiens tout à fait ce qu'elle a dit, parce qu'en effet, tout est fait pour que la famille n'existe pas. Ou bien elle existe, mais malheureuse, mais pas heureuse. C'est-à-dire que tout est, à port, tout est là pour faire en sorte que les gens qui vivent en famille finissent par penser que la famille est nocive pour eux et que la meilleure manière, c'est de la disloquer et de vivre chacun pour soi, comme cela, cela nous coûtera moins cher. C'est une erreur de calcul parce que ça coûte horriblement cher. Ne serait-ce que quand on voit, par exemple, ce que les services sociaux dé dépensent pour compenser les problèmes que cela pose à des, aux individus lorsqu'ils n'ont pas cette structure familiale qui leur permet de pouvoir faire face aux conditions de la vie, surtout quand cette vie devient de plus en plus difficile. Alors ce qui est important à savoir, c'est qu'on ne fonde pas une famille comme cela. La famille se fonde à partir de la valeur de chacun de ceux qui vont la fonder. Donc chacun, que ce soit la femme ou l'homme, parce que pour moi et pour l'islam que je respecte, il n'y a d'autre famille que cette famille-là. Il ne saurait y avoir d'autre famille que cette famille-là, quand bien même aujourd'hui la démocratie et le droit veulent nous faire accepter qu'il y a d'autres familles que celle-là. Donc, la famille, elle se compose de deux êtres, au départ, et ces deux êtres-là doivent être conscients, chacun, de quel est le rôle qu'ils doivent mener l'un avec l'autre pour pouvoir donner naissance à d'autres enfants qui vont vivre d'une part dans l'affection, dans le partage, dans la solidarité, non seulement dans le cadre de leur famille, mais au-delà, dans le cadre des autres familles, par rapport à la famille à laquelle ils appartiennent et à la famille humaine aussi à laquelle ils appartiennent. Juste par mémoire pour ma chère mère qui nous a quittés il n'y a pas très longtemps, elle me disait toujours, tu sais mon fils, c'est l'affection que tu recevras dans ta famille qui te préservera des, des infections que la société est en train de te préparer. Donc, il est absolument important de savoir qu'une société saine ne peut se faire qu'à partir d'une famille saine. Mais aujourd'hui, on n'est plus dans ce cas de figure. Aujourd'hui, on essaye de réparer quelque chose qu'on a laissé se casser. Il y va de notre responsabilité. Nous n'avons pas à pleurer sur notre sort, mais les valeurs sont encore là. Dans toutes les religions, les valeurs sont là pour que ce noyau, qui est le noyau essentiel, évident de l'état de l'humanité, si ce noyau ne va pas, c'est tout l'état de l'humanité qui ne va. Donc, il y a certaines clés, comme par exemple le fait que euh, Dieu nous dit qu'il nous a créés l'un pour l'autre pour que l'on puisse se reposer euh, les uns avec les autres et que l'on puisse se porter affection, amour, compréhension. Il, euh, il nous dit aussi que euh, il ne faut pas euh, choisir seulement d'épouser, par exemple, pour fonder une femme, qu'une femme parce qu'elle est belle ou parce qu'elle est riche, mais il est important de choisir plutôt la femme qui est éduquée et qui a des principes 
qui vont nous permettre de pouvoir construire quelque chose à long terme. Parce que si l'on choisit seulement la richesse ou la beauté, la richesse peut à un moment disparaître, la beauté peut se faner, et à partir de là, lorsqu'on a eu ses choix, eh bien, on risque de se retrouver dans une situation de séparation, et là va fonctionner, bien entendu, le divorce, et ainsi de suite. Donc, ce qui est important, c'est de pouvoir faire en sorte que ce que l'on va mettre en place comme foyer soit un foyer qui génère la la sérénité qui génère la joie, qui génère aussi la force nécessaire pour lutter dans, contre les situations les plus difficiles. Il y a même un verset, et cela pourrait peut-être étonner ceux qui ne le connaissent pas, où il nous dit « Ne tuez jamais vos enfants par crainte de pauvreté. Nous, Dieu, assurerons votre nourriture et la leur. En effet, le fait de les tuer serait une grande faute impardonnable. » Aujourd'hui, on se rend compte par la pression de la, de la pauvreté, de la précarité, de la fragilité, certains sont amenés à soit dire euh, « j'en veux pas plus », soit éventuellement s'en débarrasser parce qu'ils estiment qu'ils ne pourront plus leur apporter ce que leur responsabilité doit leur apporter, et ainsi de suite. Donc nous, nous, sommes, nous ne devons pas fléchir devant des situations qui peuvent apparaître ça et là pour dire euh, « je, je ne serai pas capable de porter ma famille et à ce moment-là, je me mets dans un état de faiblesse, état de faiblesse que n'importe qui peut instrumentaliser. Donc la famille doit rester le noyau le plus résistant à l'égard de toute politique, de toute adversité, de tout conflit. La famille doit être là, c'est celle qui va permettre à l'être humain de trouver le confort, le réconfort et puis le refuge nécessaire si c'est nécessaire. Il y a aussi un autre, un autre verset, par exemple, qui dit « N'obligez pas vos filles à la prostitution si elles, si elles cherchent la chasteté au détriment des biens terrestres. Et celui qui les obligera, Dieu sera miséricordieux envers elles. » Il arrive aussi que dans certaines circonstances, que l'on voit dans certains pays où la misère, pour ne pas dire la pauvreté, mais la misère s'acharne sur ces populations, certaines gens qui, malgré le fait qu'ils sont respectueux de leur dignité, qu'ils sont respectueux de, du lien familial, se sentent obligés quelque part, d'une manière détournée, d'envoyer leurs enfants soit à des travaux qui sont absolument indignes, soit les filles à aller chercher quelques menus, quelques menus deniers pour pouvoir faire survivre la famille. Le Coran est là pour nous dire que quoi qu'il arrive, nous devons être respectueux de cette famille, parce que le meilleur pour sa famille, Dieu dit, est celui, euh, le, le meilleur auprès de moi est celui qui est le meilleur pour sa famille. Donc, nous ne sommes pas, nous ne sommes pas dans un état de tâtonnement. Euh, la famille, ce n'est pas quelque chose qui nous est inconnu et que subitement, on, se, on découvre que ça n'existe plus. Nous avons, malheureusement, par les choix que nous avons faits, nous avons œuvré à, pour que cette famille euh, soit dans cette situation euh, disloquée, délicate. Comme disait la dame, euh, on n'a plus la possibilité de soutenir nos enfants pour leurs études, tout simplement parce que euh, les moyens dont on dispose sont des moyens qui sont terriblement, horriblement, exagérément euh, taxé et alors à ce moment-là, la seule proposition qui nous reste, c'est de casser la famille euh, et, et pour qu'on puisse euh, éventuellement vivre de leur mendicité que l'État veut bien mettre à notre disposition. Euh, sans trop prolonger, et peut-être qu'à travers les questions qui se poseront tout à l'heure, euh, je pourrais répondre à certaines situations qui prévalent aujourd'hui dans nos pays et qui ne sont pas tout à fait à l'image de ce que l'islam nous enseigne, ni la tradition prophétique. prophétique. Le fait est simplement ce que je voulais dire à travers la perspective de l'islam, c'est qu'il y a des valeurs qui ont été enseignées à l'homme, c'est l'homme qui les a négligées, et si aujourd'hui nous sommes dans cet état-là, c'est qu'on a favorisé la matière au lieu de favoriser l'esprit de l'être humain. Merci. Monsieur Afid Wardiri, euh, merci de nous avoir encore exprimé la valeur de la famille et l'importance de la famille en tant que noyau pour une bonne société saine. Donc voilà, nous allons passer à à notre prochain uh, intervenant. Maybe I may speak now in English. Because, uh, sorry. <laughs> so I may now introduce in English. This is uh, Mrs. Nancy Sontag, Lyon. Yes. 
Um, she is, um, sorry, uh, she is a representative of a Later Day Saints Charities in Geneva, a former state representative serving three terms in Utah House of Representatives, co-chairing the Higher Education Appropriation Subcommittee, assistant VP for Government Affairs at the University of Utah. So this is your turn. Thank you so much. Am I on? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it is a delight to be here. It is a, a delight to be, to see so many uh, like-minded people who value the family and uh, whose, whose hearts beat as, as ours do uh, in honoring the family. Uh, we're honored to, uh, and I am honored to participate in this, this conference commemorating the 20th anniversary of the International Year of the Family. As a faith-based organization, you may wonder who we are and what do we see as our defining mission. Latter-day Saint Charities is the humanitarian arm of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. And uh, it has a very unique support structure and because of this, LDS Charities has access to the resources of our church, which include food production and processing, donated used clothing, employment and social services, and the ability to purchase goods locally in many parts of the world. We sponsor relief and development projects in 179 countries. Assistance is rendered without regard to race, religious affiliation, or nationality, and it's based on the core principles of personal responsibility, community support, self-reliance, and sustainability. It is largely run with volunteer labor, uh, operating both independently and in cooperation with other charitable organizations and governments. More than one million man days of labor are contributed yearly by volunteers in support of these initiatives. LDS Charities uh, provides emergency relief assistance in times of natural disasters. In addition, our primary community development programs include clean water, neonatal resuscitation, training, vision care, wheelchairs, immunizations, food production, and other health programs. And as a faith-based NGO in consultative status with ECOSOC, our focus is humanitarian relief and refugees and development on the one hand, and on the other hand, our focus is on human rights, particularly freedom of religion or belief and the family. And why do we do these things? LDS Charities is literally an application of the admonition of Jesus Christ to help others in need. We believe that each of us are brothers and sisters, and reaching out with helping hands to those in need is putting our faith in action. Like other faith-based organizations that focus on service to others, it allows for opportunities to assist where it otherwise may be difficult or to be accepted or even uh, to be allowed into a country. We are here today to celebrate the family. Let me share with you some very wise words expressed by a former president of our church, David O. McKay, who said, no other success can compensate for failure in the home powerful and profound counsel for parents and for policymakers alike. In our work at the United Nations, my husband Joseph and I are guided by three foundational uh, principles that are core beliefs of our church. Indeed, you could call these our three pillars, faith, family, and freedom. These three pillars guide us as individuals, as members of our church, and we believe they are the recipe for positive growth, change, and development throughout the world. 
They are inextricably woven, connected, sustaining and strengthening each other. When one of them is struck, the other two are damaged. Professor Amy Wax, who is a professor at the University Law, uh, of Pennsylvania Law School, wrote that the decreasing commitment to traditional marriage and the declining birth rate, birth rates that go along with that, um, pose, and I quote, an urgent and unavoidable challenge, both to our continuation as a society and to our very conception of the, of the worth of human existence. She asked, is the demographic implosion a, res a response to practical costs and benefits, or does it tell us something deeper about a loss of purpose or faith? End of quote. We do, we do live in challenging times. Faith is waning, as has been made, mentioned, and under attack. Family, as we have known it for millennia, is under attack. Freedom is challenged and under attack. We are witnessing in much of the developing world a cultural shift that characterized, uh, a sh shift characterized by less and less affiliation with organized or institutional religion. If faith declines, are there societal consequences or repercussions? How does this waning religiosity impact families and societies? Should we be concerned? What is the significance of marriage and the family to the economy? In his report, The Rise of Post-familialism, Joel Kotkin noted that one of the commonalities between all of the major religions is that they elevate family and kinship to a central place in human existence. Secularism tends toward agnosticism about the family. This distinction has real world consequences. Take any cohort and in his case, he's looking at Americans, but I think you could apply it literally anywhere. Take any cohort by race, income, education, and sort them by religious belief. The more devout they are, the higher their rates of marriage, and the more children they have. Patrick Fagan, who is a senior fellow and Director of Marriage and Religion Research Institute at the Family Research Council, made this on, uh, observation about the impact of families on the American economy. No matter which way you look at it, through the lens of income, savings, or poverty, marriage is the great engine of the economy, with every household a building block that either contributes or takes away millions of times over. Put all those families together and we have the team that runs the American economy. But the family as economic driver goes far beyond an American phenomenon. Uh, in 1996, the Pontifical Council uh, for the Family brought together 60 experts on economic and social questions, including Nobel laureates, for an international meeting on the family and economy of the, in the future of society. This august body asserted that, and I quote, every person represents the creative potential which is the real wealth of nations, human capital, and recognize that it is the greatest resource for, the, for a healthy economy. The foundation of human capital is strong family life, family is both the producer of human capital and its first investor. Above all, the family transmits values and virtues, creating human capital in the true sense, men and women who are willing to give of themselves, to make commitments, to trust others, and to cooperate with them. Without this ethical social basis, a strong economy cannot develop or be sustained. The family is thus the key to a healthy society and its economy. If the family flourishes, society will be sound, but this is a reciprocal process. The family cannot survive without a good economy, 
and society cannot survive without good families. Have things changed since 1996? In many ways. Should we be making different policy decisions about the family and marriage? More recently, uh, in May of this year, Pope Francis spoke to a gathering of the UN System Chief Executives uh, Board for Coordination, including Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, where he counseled that future sustainable development goals must be formulated and carried out with generosity and courage so that they can have a real impact on poverty and hunger, protect the environment, and provide appropriate protection for the family, which is an essential element in sustainable human and social development. As we see the political and cultural pressures bearing down on marriage and by association on the family, it is easy to feel discouraged about the future prospects of mankind. Michael Novak, a, an American Catholic philosopher, journalist, and diplomat, wrote nearly 40 years ago that clearly the family is the seedbed of economic skills. Even when poverty and disorientation strike, it is the family strength that most defends individuals against alienation or despair. One unforgettable law that has been learned painfully through all the oppressions, disasters, and injustices of the last thousand years, if things go well with the family, life is worth living. When the family falters, life falls apart. Joe and I have been married for 42 years. We are the parents of four daughters and one son. They are now married and starting their own families. We have nine grandchildren. Was it easy? Or should I say, has, is it easy? It still is in the present tense. <laughs> is it easy? <laughs> no. <laughs> is it worth it? Yes, but we have learned that our family work continues and our, our rising generation is still part of our work. And that is the big question, isn't it, for the diversity of marriage relationships that exist in the world today. Will there be rising generations? Many years ago, a tornado touched down in Florida, in the US. One woman living in a mobile home went, uh, in, went into her bathroom for safety. The mobile home began to shake violently. A few moments passed and things subsided. And then she heard her neighbor's voice. I am here in the front room. Coming out of the bathroom, to her great astonishment, she discovered that the tornado had picked up her mobile home and carried it through the air, landing it perfectly upright on the top of her neighbor's mobile home. <laughs> I share this episode as an example of what is literally happening in our time. Social norms and lives are being shaken disrupted and challenged in many ways. These are wonderful times that we live in, but some would say, as Thomas Paine, one of the American revolutionary leaders, these are the times that try men's, and I would say, and women's souls. For our families and for one another, let us be the reassuring voice and comforting voice they hear saying, I am here. A powerful yet simple formula for strengthening the nations of the world. Faith, family, freedom. I conclude by repeating the words of wisdom of David O. McKay. No success can compensate for failure in the home. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Uh, Sontag Vion, for this uh, to remind us these three piliers: faith and um, families and freedom. So now we come to the next speaker. This is uh, Mr. Joseph Misseton. Yes, <laughs> Joseph Misseton. He is a consultant for business, NGO, and psychotherapist. He is also married, of course, and he has three children. Yes. And he's a spokesman on ethics and family affairs, NGO, Hermetic International. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the invitation to this important event. At the location of the United Nations, a place of hope and opportunity set within the beauty of Switzerland. The title of my speech is Commun Communication of Values, a chance for civil society, NGOs and faith-based organizations in strengthening personality, family and nations. Values influence behavior whether we like it or not. Let's envision a society that progresses forward by promoting personal development, mutual cooperation and meaningful living. Here it is important to distinguish between living happily and living meaningfully. Those who experience meaning in life approach and master life's challenges with a positive attitude. A person discovers meaning through relationships and experiences that go beyond the level of the individual. The great Austrian doctor, psychologist and psychotherapist Viktor Frankl adopted the search for meaning as the primary focus of his work. Dr. Frankl, a man who himself experienced extreme challenges and suffering in the concentration camp, concluded that it was each person's duty to give an answer to the questions of life. The questions are unique to each person. However, there are some similarities that are common to all people. As such, in our pursuit of meaning, we will always be confronted with the issue of transcendence, that which goes beyond the limits of our own individual beings. An experience that leads us to several major questions. Where do we come from? Where are we going? What is our mission in life? What's our calling? What's our job? What do we human beings all have in common? On the one hand, we are creatures of self-determination, or as biologist Umberto Maturana put it, are autopoietic. That is to say that a person can't be compelled in any direction from the outside. Through your will and belief, we shape our lives surrounded by nature and an ever-expanding universe, a form of higher energy with which we interact. So we are the creators of our own life. We also interact with other people. And our actions as individuals impact our environment. That can be observed quite clearly. If we look within our own family, if we are inwardly calm, clear and friendly, that mindset impacts our environment rather quickly. We do not feel stressed by squabbling children, nor do we allow ourselves to be burdened by the misfortunes of our partners. When we remain in such a frame of mind, we remain a source of goodness. Conversely, if we are in a bad mood, dance restless or not at peace with ourselves, or if we feel alone and frightened, we produce exactly the same negative effect on the outside. The inside matches the outside. If we wish to change the world, then we must first change ourselves. A truth that human race has known for thousands of years. But how can we do that? What allows us to progress further? In my role as a husband, father, son, friend, psychotherapist, business and NGO consultant, and a seeker of universal wisdom, one single common denominator has become clear to me. One shared by constitutions, corporate cultures, 
psychotherapeutic schools, families, and even individuals in different cultures. These are values. Values are the common denominator. How do we define values? To date, there is no uniformly accepted definition of values. The fact alone can be taken as a clear indication of the true depth and complexity of human existence. A definition, a definition of Clement Sednak describes values as highly emotional, charged ideas about what is desirable with relatively general and permanent evaluation criteria. That means values are abstract concepts that provide us with orientation and guide us into the future. But at the same time, they are rooted in important lessons from our past. They become fixed stars in the dark night, serving as a compass and showing us the way. In different situations and contexts, values remain stable over a long period of time. Nevertheless, over time, with new experiences and greater maturation, new values may press further towards the forefront. There's a world of difference between the 18-year-old just leaving home and the 65-year-old retiree entering the final chapters of his life. Certain values remain unchanged, while others either gain or lose significance. If we base our definition on the model of the researcher Shalom Schwarz, values reflect, reflect the synthesis of polarities. Our whole life takes place between polarities, male, female, light, dark, hot, cold, positive, negative, etc. The tension between the poles generates movement, meaning that if we really want something, there's a tension between the actual state of reality and the desired target state. The Latin word movere, from which the word motivation derives its meaning, means to set in motion. As such, we should be able to see that motivation is always the result of an internal process, internal attitudes, and the difference between what the reality is and what and what we want it to be. Clearly, motivation comes from within. That's an interesting point to note. The union of contrasts creates movement, creates integration, and finally creates wholeness. However, as soon as we tend too strongly towards one pole, negative effects are triggered. The same principle applies to values. Let's take a look at the Schwarz value scale. We have on the one hand self-enhancement and on the other hand self-transcendence. The second scale is on the one hand the open, openness to change and conservation. If we will now and literally emphasize one pole too strongly, for example, if we were to exaggerate attachment while neglecting our own autonomy in partnership, we would find ourselves creating dependency and artificially limiting ourselves. Conversely, if we exaggerate our own autonomy, we create distance and lose attachment. What does it mean for marriage and family? How can we outline a value process? First, of all, it's our duty to become aware of our own values. We must make certain to orient our values toward meaning in our lives. If we link our value system to a mere checklist without considering our feelings, values are powerless and meaningless. We remain at the surface level of our personality. Second, identify your roles and what they mean with regard to your values and your behavior. If we have established our values clearly, it is then necessary to take this information from the abstract and integrate it into our daily life. What's the attitude towards life that we derive from integrating our values and in which behaviors is our attitude evident? Third, ask yourself what implications your values have for your three life environments, family, work and connections. Define your values based on your family. 
using the example of family and collaborating with your partner and subsequently with your children, it would be possible to define common partner or family value, values, a family mission statement. In my family, for example, in an exciting process over month, uh, we, we were, uh, just for uh, we, all five family members were included with that was a family mission statement for ourselves. The participatory process here was at least as important as the values we ultimately defined. In other words, the process is just as important as the result. Having outlined how values can be worked out, let's have a look at how civil society, NGOs and faith-based organizations can contribute to strengthening personality, family and nations. According to research carried out by Will Arts and Luke Hellman in the framework of the European Values Study, in Austria as well as in the rest of Europe, traditional normative religious values are declining across generations. So we can see in Austria the Catholic, the Roman Catholic and Protestant churches with the values they transmit are becoming more and more disconnected from the Austrian people. Thus, a traditional set of values that once provided a degree of security and influenced human development and families is disappearing. But who transmits values now? Schools? Businesses? A value vacuum emerges, which in the end will lead to a search for meaning and orientation, often sought in other spiritual movements. As Eric Frums once said, we are free from something, but do not yet know exactly how. In summary, we usually only put our values into practice in our daily life, lives at a subconscious level. Thus, values mostly remain below the threshold of our consciousness. So self-reflection, external stimuli and feedback, we can become aware of our own values. That is to say, that our values become perceptible and visible to us. Just as the contents of a dark room only become visible to us when the light is turned on. By becoming consciously aware of our own values, we can use them as tools to help us along in our daily lives. Therefore, it is necessary to develop programs for individuals, couples and families that help us learn about and gain a deeper understanding of our individual values and our individual selves. The self-knowledge gained in the process subsequently helps us to shape our relationships in an autonomous, major manner with more freedom and sustainability. We move away from the delusion that our partner is responsible for our happiness in life, which often leads to emotional overload and to divorce. We move away from the notion that others are responsible for our lives that we are victims of circumstance, of situation or other people. Thus, impulses are given in such a way that people are more fully autonomous and are therefore able to cultivate healthier relationships. The process essentially renews our relationships on the foundation of each individual's own more major personality. Consciously developed common values lead families to share powerful images and impulses providing direction and clarity for the core building blocks of society when it comes to decisions, conflicts and goals. By developing and communicating values, NGAs and faith-based organizations in particular can assume a great responsibility in order to strengthen personalities, families and nations and thereby contribute to the further evolution of mankind. As stated in the beginning, Values determine our lives, whether we like it or not. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Joseph Misseton. Um, now we come to our last uh, speaker from uh, these panels. We had uh, also another lady who sh should have come. Who is not here, and she's Mrs. Uh, Yardaze Kombans, yes. Anyway, she is in Africa. She has been called to for a mission in Africa. I think. So she has a one representative here of her. Yeah. 
She's over there. The young one, very young. This lady is a, as a, who's supposed to be his secretary general for the youth world, um, youth, uh, young women, sorry, Christian association, young women Christians. Okay. So we come to the our next speaker is uh, Mr. Tim Timothy Miller, who is the vice president of uh, Family Federation for World Peace and Unification in Europe. So he's also a children and family social worker for many years, a board member of South East England Face Forum. He's also currently health and social care coordinator, British Red Cross, East uh, East Sussex. Yes. <laughs> So, Good afternoon, everybody. Nice to see you. Um, I'm, as mentioned, I'm on the board for the Faiths Forum of the Southeast of England. It's the whole Southeast of England except uh, for London. A few years back, one of their first tasks when they were getting government funding was to do a survey of the contribution of religious people to the charitable and voluntary sector in that part of the country. And it's staggering how much people of religious conviction contribute through their voluntary action and through their charitable work. And uh, one thing I always really want to encourage is that, you know, we, we need confidence that people of religious conviction are many times huge contributors. As I came in on the train from the airport yesterday evening, just going by on the train, I saw the sign, Salvation Army. Uh, you know, one of the buildings there, and um, we have a local Salvation Army as well where I live. I think of so many religious bodies that express their relevance to society through their giving, but in their giving didn't lose their conviction, but strengthened it and found the energy to maintain it. And I think that's also enormously important. And actually, in an era where religion is increasingly less attractive to young people, it's crucially important that religious people are socially engaged. Uh, very, very important. I've been very encouraged where I live. I live in a town which is part of a, a broader area with maybe 250, 300,000 people. My town has about 100,000 people in it. But in this town and the neighboring town, local Christians become increasingly social act, socially active. For example, we have a project called the Street Pastors Project. I don't know if you're aware of this in other communities, but our local Christian staff a service on Friday night and Saturday night for young people who are coming out of the clubs and the, and the pubs, the drinking places, to keep them safe from you know, 11 o'clock at night till 5 o'clock in the morning. And the police are so profoundly grateful for their input. And it's made such a sense of worth and value to the local Christian community and created a, a collaboration belong denomination, which is enormously important. I also uh, spent time as a trustee for my local council for voluntary services. In my little town of uh, less than 100,000 people, there are 800 voluntary organizations. And I was on the body that helped support and you know, help those voluntary organizations to work well. I also spent uh, about six years up to 2005 working as a children and families voluntary, uh, children and family social worker. Part of that time was spent working, working in a therapeutic community. We looked after 12 children under the age of 12 years old. It took 20 staff plus highly skilled professional input and cost in excess of 4,000 euros per month to look after each one of those 12 children. Just think what that means. And working as I did, uh, supporting foster families, I was dealing with children who were no longer with their birth families. They were placed in other families who did, in many cases, a marvelous job in trying to create stability from great instability. Because what a contradiction it is. In one way, your parents are the source of your life, your very identity. On the other way, those parents were also the source of abuse and enormous insecurity. So I saw those kids as they were taken to contact, supervised contact. I supervised contact for kids with their physical parents who were not able to be with them. And saw the disruption that caused afterwards when they went back to their foster carers. Currently, uh, just this last year, 
I'm working with the Red Cross, uh, helping to in increase community resilience. What does that mean? It means supporting and recruiting volunteers to go in and support carers in their own homes. And this, of course, is 60% to do with elderly people. Often one elderly person looking after another who's now got dementia. Other cases looking after elderly parents who are taking care of a 50-year-old 50 50 year son with huge disability issues. Incredible, incredible devotion that's being manifested in that way. I mean, what's this got to do with my picture? Well, I want, to, I want to really advocate for the contribution that the voluntary sector and the people of religious conviction make to our society. And we need to speak up for what we do, otherwise we'll have, we will have this situation where people just don't recognize our value and young people don't see the value. Same as with marriage and family. Tomorrow is my wedding anniversary. <clears throat> it's uh, 32 years since my wedding. I was, born, I was married in a wedding like that. I was, I was married in Madison Square Garden, where you normally have basketball or boxing, with 2,000 other couples. And most of those, nearly all of those couples were international. Many of them were interracial. Some of them were between people from different religious backgrounds. But at that point in time, we were all people of, of the same faith. What faith? I, I'm a unificationist. I'm a follower of the Reverend Samia Moon. Very controversial at that time. But it made such an impact on New York, New York City. 4,000 people in you know, dark suits and white wedding dresses walking down the street to, to Madison Square Gardens. And we had just an amazing expression of our idealism. Because that event was all dedicated to world peace through the family. And I was an idealistic person in my you know, late 20s, really uh, convinced that you know, we would transform the world through our commitment to go beyond enmity. My wife's German. First time I met my father-in-law, it was an easy experience because of the enemy background. My father-in-law was in the SS, he was also on the Russian front. He said to me, I, I can speak English, but I'm never going to speak to you in English. <laughs> but actually, we had a very good relationship, and I learned that this was actually a very wonderful human being. So I directly experienced within my own family the going beyond difference. My wife also experienced it, because when we moved to where we live now, having had very profound experiences previously in London working with black people, my wife had very profound experiences working with the Jewish community where I live. And which led to the point where, you know, huge, profound reconciliation took place between herself and people who had fled to Nazi Germany and had very I can't go into the whole story, but very profound experiences. Anyhow, that marriage I was in in 1982, that was just people of my faith. Uh, international, interracial, and background interreligious, but just people of my faith. But then 10 years later in 1992, our founder asked us to bring people, not just from our own faith, but from all religious backgrounds, to a much larger event of 30,000 couples in the stadium that was used just four years previously, oh, sorry, yeah, four years previously for the Olympic Games in Seoul. And I traveled there on a jumbo jet with a very mature Muslim couple, an even more mature Sikh couple, <laughs> The husband was a famous professor of ecology. His wife was an agony aunt for the Asian community and also a mature Christian couple. And we participated sitting in the outside of the stadium, rededicating our marriages, but at the same time giving our support to thousands of young couples who were on the floor of the stadium, making their marriage commitment for the first time. And it was just extraordinary how that celebration of marriage and family impacted us and created a sense of working together. And this is the other thing I really want to talk about. Myself, I got involved in my faith and one very influential factor in that was because I think religion has no credibility if people can't get go beyond denomination and can't even go beyond faith in cooperating with one another. So I think one contribution, a unique contribution Unification Movement or Family Federation for World Peace and Unification, which is the name of our religion now, can make is in bringing together people of different faith backgrounds in this matter of marriage and family. Because almost without exception, faiths share very similar views. 
I notice how difficult it is for sometimes us to go over the barrier, well, when I was younger, of denominational difference within Christianity, and now of difference of religion. But in the last uh, 25 plus years of working interreligiously, I've had enormously positive experiences working beyond faith difference, and finding and discovering through sharing common tasks the incredible value of other human beings who dress very differently, who worship very differently, who go to very different ceremonies, who have a different set of scriptures, but have profoundly beautiful character. This is 10 years later, sorry, 20 years later again. This is 2012, the last such large wedding event that uh, our founder, Father Moon, presided over with his wife. His wife did again just, uh, last, just this year and the year before. But um, I think it's so crucially important that we work together beyond faith difference. And if we do that, not only will we strengthen the cause for marriage and family, which we all hold so dear, but actually we will also find ways to value and appreciate one another beyond difference, which will be a saving grace you know, for the future of our world, I, I really believe. Okay, that's just my first slide. I better get on to another one. <laughs> Anyhow, here's, you know, those events turned into occasions not just uh, officiated over by my faith, but of course officiated over by representatives of different faiths who gave their blessing on that occasion. So, in other words, we need to reach beyond our comfort zone. And for me, it was a big challenge, in a sense, to invite into our deeply important religious ceremony people of other faiths. It was a huge challenge, you know, but a very important challenge, which led me particularly into, into the interreligious experience. Anyhow, in a sense, when we're gathered here together, as the British would say, uh, we're singing to the choir. In other words, we all here appreciate marriage and family. But we do need to find the ways to present it that make you know, a huge impact and convince people of the importance of upholding these values. For me, uh, post-Second World War, our part of the world, our rich world, has been almost obsessed with economy. But I, am, I have no doubt about it whatsoever. Those children in the therapeutic community, 4,000 euros each for, you know, for, for a month. I mean, there's no more important place to hold value than in the family. Because the capacity to love, and especially to make commitments and sustain them through difficulty, this is very hard to gain quick to lose and very difficult to recover. So, you know, the, the store of lasting love in a family, if you lose it, if you see a society where, I think Stephen was mentioning that in his talk, where the capacity to, to build a lasting relationship of love is diminishing, not increasing. We have hugely expensive in terms of human pain and also in terms of cost future that lies ahead of us. In the end, let's face it, you know, however much we have ideals, however much we have wonderful institutions like the UN or humanitarian organizations or people of religious conviction, uh, what matters in the end is the quality of the people who staff and lead those organizations. I'm deeply impressed now working, I worked for many years for UBF and, and FFWPU, Family Federation and uh, International, I'm now working with the Red Cross. The thing that impresses me most is the quality of the people involved. Because they're not there for the money, usually because they don't get much. Isn't that extraordinary? Some of the most caring and important giving roles in our society, people earn very little money. But they're profoundly motivated. One of them was working, um, one of my colleagues now was working in, in the world of high finance and banking before, and he said, it saved my life to join the Red Cross. I get much less money, but I'm doing something that really is in tune with my heart and my desire. So, you know, it's human character, which is largely shaped by experiences in the family, as well as the surrounding educational systems of society, which determines our capacity. So we do also together need to work out a sort of ideology of the family. And I don't think that uh, uh, the Family Federation has a monopoly on that at all, but maybe we have something to offer. One thing I like to offer, because I, I was very involved in this sort of conference for many years, and I worked a lot with the Ambassadors for Peace movement that works with UBF, and that was people of very diverse religious backgrounds. So I learned to give presentations that didn't just come from 
biblical scriptural background, but from a whole variety of scriptures. Anyhow, uh, much of our view or ideology of family is based on Genesis 1.28 and the blessings of God saying to Adam and Eve, uh, become fruitful, multiply, have dominion. And it relates to somehow how we find peace. And that relates also to my colleague who just spoke before me. And this whole concept of religion's capacity to help people to find peace within themselves. And, you know, what I would express very much in that is our ideals, you know, springing from God and religious conviction, uh, don't become reality just because we believe in them. They become reality when we practice them. When... The thoughts become deeds and actions, or where mind and body meet. So the crucial place is not the realm just of belief and thought, but it's actually in daily life where thought and deed become one. And that's actually the place the good character is formulated. So it's, it's enormously important, but it's also the case when you... That becomes the precondition, actually, for good marriages. If we don't have the, the, the maturity to be able to love unselfishly. If we don't have the maturity to think of the other before myself, it's very unlikely we're going to make a successful marriage. So we bring that first level of peace, as it were, to the next level. And the critical area is how do husband and wife meet? You know, under what motivation do they meet? I would say definitely their motivation has to be rooted in their ideals. And this is fundamentally the function that religion has been carrying out. It's calling us to make families and marriages and live lives which are pleasing not just to me, but for the sake of pleasing God and higher ideals and for the sake of the wider community. So I think, you know, when I was in that marriage for world peace, I was convinced that my marriage was contributing to world peace. I think it's very important we see the context of my daily life within a wider sense of responsibility for how we're benefiting society and how we're benefiting the wider world. So much more to say about that, but, you know, Making my own good family is not just for my own sake. It is to make my parents happy. It is to make grandparents happy. It is to make my wider family and society. And if you have that sense, it gives you a lot more of that determination to see through the inevitable difficult and challenging moments. Not only that, when in such families we raise people of, of, uh, who have capacities to love and live for others, they bring that capacity into their, their wider life. They bring it into their economic life, for example. They bring it into their business practice. You know, they, they bring it into their, the way they deal with their possessions and their wealth and their sense of giving and generosity to wider people. It, it impacts our relationship, human relationship with the natural world. I am a person of religious conviction. I do believe that God created us and created an incredibly beautiful world for us to live in. But obviously, it's critically important that we relate to that world in a way that's sensitive to God, thoughtful of future generations, if we're going to have enduring, enduring peace and prosperity. So I have no question also, but that religious people have a huge contribution to make to making our world a sustainable world, and a world we respect and care for the natural world. But that's rooted in terms of actual daily practice. It's not rooted just in beliefs. It's rooted in how you develop character and how you develop daily practice. And where's that learned? That's learned through living example. Where's the first place of living example? Unquestionably, it's in the family and the, and the, and the, the, the circles of relationship that surround the family. So, you know, of these three blessings from God to us, which we need to substantiate in our lives and return to God, I have no doubt whatsoever that it's the middle one which is the most central. Because... Uh, that is the most extraordinary place. I don't think there's a pointer on this. You know, when you see that place where a husband and wife meet, you know, in my in my beliefs theology, that is such a sacred place. I believe it's so in many, many different religious convictions. Because that's in a sense the place where man and woman meet, that's the place where God comes down and love turns into life. What an amazing miracle when love turns into life. And how important it is how that meeting takes place and it's the right place for love to turn into life and life to be nurtured. So, you know, that meeting place ideally is the place that God comes down on earth and the love of God passes to the next generation. So, um, you know, one thing that our founders very hot on is love. 
but actually he's even more concerned about lineage. His expression is, love, life, and lineage, which you think has most value? Many people think it's love. However, no matter how valuable love and life are, they are horizontal in nature. What on earth does he mean by that? They appear and conclude within one generation. On the other hand, lineage is vertical in nature and continues forever, generation after generation. So this is the challenge. I look at my, my Mormon friends here, and I look at my own religious community, and we are barely heading in this part of the world as a religious community into our second and third generation. The big challenge will be, can we substantiate our values and pass them to our children and to our children's children. This will be the crucial factor. And then what I see amongst my children's school friends is they were growing up, my children are grown up now, but when I saw their school friends, isn't it remarkable how some people have the fortune of a family background and a character that makes it apparently so much easier for them to get along with others, while other people it's as I said, I work with children who have been sexually, emotionally, physically abused. I'm not saying that's an irrecoverable situation. And some of the foster families I work with and some people in the therapy community, we help people to recover. But it's mighty difficult to recover. So the things that we pass from generation to generation are hugely important. And we are in an incredibly dangerous position as a wealthy Western society that has the benefit of a long 2,000 year religious history, even further back than that through Judaism, we are in great danger of losing all of that huge historical benefit uh, that we have. So just, uh, I don't have time to go through all of these. You can have the presentation, I've got quotes here, you'll just see them flash out from Judaism, from Islam, from Hinduism, from Christianity, from Buddhism, from Confucianism, from the I Ching, and here, I'll just read the last one. African traditional thought. Uh, this is a prayer that's said at, at, at a wedding. Uh, my father, thank you for showing me affection. My mother, thank you for making me comfortable. Thank you for clothing me with wisdom, which is more important than providing me with clothes. So, you know, there's so much wisdom. There's the wisdom that endured through centuries. It's talking about truths which aren't a matter of fashion. I think, I think we need to create a fashion, right? Because we need to swing the pendulum back towards realizing the importance of these matters. But, uh, you know, it's, we share it in common as people of uh, ethical and religious conviction. Uh, also, as a woman, we're very into purity before marriage, we're very into fidelity within marriage. But it's tough to maintain it in this society, right? But I have no question about it. If you want to learn to make commitment, you don't learn it by practicing relationships and breaking them time and time again as the foundation for securing a committed relationship between husband and wife. You, you establish a, a commitment which enables you to be a, a lasting husband and wife through actually uh, showing commitment in your previous relationships. Okay, anyhow, I'm, I'm out of time. Come back to that. Where's the secure place to store our wealth? Not our money, not our banks. We know about that. But actually, in the generations of family. Thank you. Is there is no question answer, right? Is there is time for question answers? Is there is yeah, a, yeah. Couple maybe, questions, uh, but also don't forget tomorrow we'll have Yeah, that's right. Tomorrow we have more time. Questions is fine. Yeah, okay. Tomorrow we'll have more time to uh, to have question answer, to discuss more, to exchange more. So at uh, this or if you have one question, maybe just one. That's all right. <laughs> so thank you very much to our speakers. So we we'll Good morning, everybody. Hello. Um, this day was very inspiring. Uh,